<clears throat> Very uh, warm welcome to our attendees, both online and face to face. This is one of our common hybrid systems, so we may have a thousand people uh, logging in from all over the world, but I doubt it. <laughs> Not that many. Uh, but very happy to see all of you here. And let me start my timer so I don't uh, go over time. So we have a very interesting series of talks by our local uh, scientists. Uh, and I'd like to start, maybe because I'm one of the oldest, uh, <laughs> I will talk about a bit of history of malaria, uh, wars, droughts, and pills. So I'm going to split my talk into three sections. Uh, and very briefly, because 10 minutes will not do justice to all these topics. We'll talk briefly about the history of the disease, of the major discoveries in relation to the parasite life cycle, and my favorite topic, uh, malaria cures. So malaria, as many of us here know, has been around since antiquity, since thousands of years. One example would be Egyptian mummies. So there's some evidence that they have some pathologies, if you look at them, uh, related to malaria um, pathologies, but when you do an antigen test on these 5,000 year old mummies, they turn up positive for malaria antigen. So um, you can actually apply modern technologies on ancient artifacts and tell that well, malaria has been around for at least 5,000 years uh, in Egypt. But looking at how malaria uh, moved from Africa, out of Africa to other parts of the world, uh, there are there are some there are different models, right? Different uh, kind of uh, proposals. One one idea is uh, in in the part of the first century, um, uh, malaria traveled uh, by trade routes uh, from Africa. Uh, let me get the point out so it's more educational. Via uh, trade routes uh, to, uh, from to Greece via the Nile River, then to Rome, right? And then uh, Roman soldiers then brought. Uh, malaria to England and Denmark. So malaria was a big issue uh, globally, but in, let's say in, in Italy, uh, it was associated with marshlands, uh, decaying matter, uh, and that's why um, the idea is the word malaria uh, uh, came to become malaria. Malaria means bad air. Uh, and you know, Rome, the Roman Empire fell uh, on 79 AD, and it was uh, very much believed that malaria brought the Roman Empire to its knees. So when you visit Rome and see all these beautiful Roman uh, ruins, uh, malaria had a role in ruining the, the Roman uh, Empire. And as you know, the Americas were one of the last uh, continents to be colonized by, by um, uh, humans. And we have how, how malaria got to Americas. Uh, one thing is quite clear that uh, the transatlantic Atlantic slave trade brought a uh, pasmodium falciparum uh, to the Americas. Uh, but for the other species, it, it's kind of thought that uh, Euro European explorers uh, brought them to the Americas, but um, that's quite controversial. New genetic information suggests that it's not really um, true European explorers. Okay. So I'm gonna to skip to uh, the current situation in terms of Malaria in Singapore, Tun Hong will share a bit more uh, later on. Now, the disease is still prevalent today, okay? But we are doing much better. In the last two decades, uh, government agencies, WHO, Bill and Melinda Gates foundations have all led to a lot of significant uh, progress in terms of malaria control. So for falciparum malaria, the most um, virulent of the species, uh, that's been declined in burden over the last two decades. Uh, incidence dropping. Uh, by about 30%, and mortality declining by almost 50%. When we used to teach malaria, we said a child would die of malaria every 30 seconds. Now, we say a child would die of malaria every 30 minutes. Right? So we, a child still dies, right? But uh, we have done well, but there's still more to do. Hence this event, hence the awareness and education on malaria research and so on. Now, plasmodium vivax, we see this as an emerging interest. Uh, it's more globally widespread. And over the last two decades, uh, the burden research. Okay. So try to get up the mic. Huh? Okay. Maybe this will be better. There's apparently some feedback. Yeah. Sorry. I apologize to our online uh, online attendees. Okay. So um, for Vivex, it's more globally widespread. 
And uh, we, we see this uh, in, in many countries in Southeast Asia where there have been uh, improvements, but the improvements have uh, stalled uh, in the last uh, five years or so. So there is therefore a need to uh, focus a bit more on uh, Vivex research and understanding how we can control Vivex malaria. Now, this is, this is the part that I like. This is where we study the, the key uh, figures uh, behind the discovery of the malaria parasite and how the life cycle was pieced together like a complicated jigsaw puzzle. So it starts with uh, Dr. Charles Lavaran, who was a French military doctor. So he, there, there were two theories in during his time about malaria. Number one, he was caused by bacteria, or it was caused by bad air. But he didn't believe it. He, he felt that it's something else. Uh, so he managed to get blood from a, a feverish soldier. Uh, and he noticed these unusual uh, structures in, in the blood of a feverish French uh, a soldier. And if you look at these drawings, for those who work on malaria, immediately you will know these are gametocytes of, of the serum. Okay? So he, he drew them. These are not considered high quality drawings for his time, uh, but uh, it's very telling enough. Uh, and for, for that discovery that it was a protozoan He was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1907. Now, he had a contemporary in, in the UK uh, who um, initially didn't really believe in uh, Lavarin's work, but eventually was a believer. His name is uh, Ronald Ross, who's also a military doctor, but a British military doctor. Now, he, his, uh, the puzzle that he, he solved was how is malaria spread? Right? So, we know it's spread by, well, the infectious agents are protozoans. But what's the vector of spread? Right? And long story short, uh, he concluded that it was the female, or rather the Anopheles mosquito, that was the causative agent of malaria. That's important. If you know that malaria is spread by mosquitoes, you can use mosquito control to halt the spread of malaria. Now, this is a controversial story. You can read up more about it. The Italians were also racing to find the vector of spread. And apparently, in fact, some Italians will claim that they were the ones that uh, determined that Anopheles mosquito was the spread. Okay? But uh, Ronald Ross won the Nobel Prize in 1902 okay, for identifying the vector of spread for malaria. Is it better now? That's not but once you move out, they can't hear you. Okay, so I stay put. Yes. Okay. Wow, I feel so restricted. <laughs> okay. So, the puzzle is being slowly uh, completed. There was a stage of the life cycle of malaria that was extremely elusive to uh, clinicians and scientists alike. Uh, what was observed is once you feed a patient with um, or a so-called volunteer with a mosquito that, that carries the malaria parasite, when the parasite appears in the blood, it is about after a week. There is a cryptic phase where the parasite is not visible, uh, uh, you know, uh, that you, you cannot determine the presence of the parasite. And uh, that took many years to unravel. Uh, and it, it was in 1948, uh, Henry Short and Cyril Garnham in the London School of Tropmed and Hygiene uh, showed conclusively, first in monkeys, rhesus monkeys, and then in humans, that uh, that cryptic face was the liver. And they, they did it in rather, uh, I would say, brutal uh, ways. Uh, they fed mosquitoes to uh, volunteer. These mos mosquitoes were infected with malaria sporozoids. And a few days later, they would do a liver biopsy of this volunteer and do sections uh, of his tissues. And this is uh, one of the published uh, uh, section in, in, in the key paper. Uh, uh, and actually, I've reproduced these, I've printed out these papers and they are in that uh, demonstration table on my left. You can re really have a look. Right? So these were published in Nature and uh, other international journals. So we've completed the life cycle. It's about 70 years to complete, right? And in different pieces, different times. So the mosquito spreads the disease. Uh, it goes to the liver. This is the cryptic phase uh, that takes place about a week to before 
uh, in red blood cells in effective forms called mirozoids infect blood cells, and these are subsequently taken up by mosquitoes to perpetuate the cycle. Now, it's interesting to note that at the time when malaria was rampant, there were other diseases that were even more troubling. One was a disease called syphilis, a sexually transmitted disease that in its terminal stages leads a patient to go mad because it infects the brain, right? Uh, and it was noticed by psychiatrists of that time that if an if a insane patient had fevers, he would do better. So the idea was to create an environment where the patient would have fevers. Uh, we call it pyrotherapy. And there was a very, uh, I would say, innovative for his time uh, psychiatrist uh, who's Austrian, uh, Julius Wagner Jorek, who felt that, well, if I give malaria fevers to my syphilitic patients, they might do better. And indeed, they did. Okay. Of course, some died from malaria, which is uh, by you know, the consequence of the infection, but he did save many thousands of lives uh, with this disease because without any treatment, it was a sure death for the syphilis patient. So here is a picture of uh, um, this man in the background is donating his Vivex blood, his Plasmodium Vivex blood to, to be introduced by this clinician or this assistant into this uh, syphilis patient, right? And this is a... Uh, uh, Julius uh, Yorek right, standing in the background. <laughs> okay, so I move to the last phase of my talk where we talk about the cures for malaria. And let's start with Peru. Okay, so in the 1600s, it was well known among the Peruvians that the, that the bark of the fever tree was very good at treating fevers. Okay, and we came to know later that these fevers were caused by malaria. This observation was not lost by the Dutch. Uh, so the Dutch uh, mass produced uh, this uh, process to extract uh, the active compound, later known as quinine, uh, in Indonesia in the 1800s. So Indonesia made the bulk of quinine in, 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 the, in the 1900s. Okay? But uh, where I'm interested in is that uh, uh, British soldiers in India in the 1800s would have to take their uh, ration of quinine, right? And uh, it's such a bitter drug that they added sugar and some added gin to mask the bitterness. And apparently that was the birth of gin and tonic. Anyway, that's why I tell my wife so that I can drink it every day, right? <laughs> so this is the, uh, the bark of the uh, chinchona tree or the Peruvian fever tree. Uh, and of course, in tonic water today, you have quinine. And the bitterness that you taste in gin and tonic is actually the quinine compound. I have a number of bottles of gin, I'm oh, sorry, tonic water, <laughs> uh, tonic water next door. Please try because the bitterness that you taste is actually from the anti malarial drug quinine. Uh, I cannot talk about anti malarials without talking about chloroquine. Okay, so, and how chloroquine was uh, discovered was born out of warfare. Okay, um, so. During World War I, uh, you know, uh, Allied control of Java led to many German soldiers uh, dying in East Africa because Germany had no access to quinine. So when the war ended, Germany said, we have to have our own anti-malarial. Then the hunt was on and they found chloroquine. Again, I'm cutting sh short a very long story. And chloroquine was introduced in 1934. Unfortunately, it didn't have much use in the war, uh, Second World War, but was used after Second World War. But a, a, a decade or two after introduction of chloroquine globally, uh, there was a kind of emergence of chloroquine resistance uh, in four different regions in the world. This set the stage for uh, drug resistance as a problem in anti-malarial. Now, chloroquine became famous not for malaria. It became famous because uh, the ex-president of the US uh, felt, or it was his opinion, that it could cure you from COVID-19, and it was later or very quickly shown not to be the case. And WHO had to put out uh, a warning that uh, um, chloroquine does not give clinical benefit when you have COVID-19. And, you know, when you talk about malaria, you have to talk about the most famous drug, and that's artemisinin, okay? 
And so we moved from Peru to China. And in China, for thousands of years, um, the Chinese had known that uh, extracts of the, uh, what they call the Qinghao plant, or what we know as Artemisia annua, was very effective in curing fevers, later known to be uh, acquired uh, as, as malaria disease. It was in 1972 uh, that uh, a, a pharmacist by training, Yu Yu Tu, uh, was able to extract the active compound and characterize it as artemisinin, right? And you know, the world has changed because of her discovery. Interestingly, this was born out of warfare again. This is when, when during the Vietnam War, North Vietnam soldiers were dying of malaria. They approached China for help in finding a cure for malaria. And hence, uh, Tu Yu Yu was actually charged with leading this team, her team, to discover the compound. Amazing that in a few short years, the screen compounds identified the, the, the active compound, did all the necessary research and found that artemisinin was ideal. It is currently the main line of defense against drug-resistant malaria, but stable resistance has emerged uh, in uh, in our region in the late 2000s. So we, we are, um, there's a clear and present danger with regards to malaria resistance. Five Nobel Prizes have been awarded because of malaria research. I've covered four, right? Uh, Ronald Ross for uh, transmission of malaria, uh, Charles Louis Alphonse Lavaran for uh, the fact that he, uh, that protozoans can cause disease, Julius uh, Yorek for the malaria to treat syphilis, UU2 for artemisinin. I didn't cover uh, Herman Mueller uh, or Paul Herman Mueller or for DDT, but uh, there's one more waiting for, for the world, and that's the vaccine, right? Uh, and I hope maybe one of the people here might, might win it or someone attending on Zoom might win this prize. So I hope you enjoyed the talk and uh, thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.